Okay, so let's start. And so today we'll be finishing, uh, this is the second lecture about polymer expansion. Uh, and we'll be using, um, separa we'll be using some linear separators. So the notion I will be using today, I mean, we have, so we have, we have this graph, had graph G, and this graph G had n vertices. And there was this notion of a separation, so A and B is a separation if like A union, they're vertex sets. So they're, they think about the entire vertex, but there's no edge between the left side and the right side. So the picture looks like the graph G is looks like this. So this is A, this is B. There's no edge going from here to here. Okay, that was separation. And it was balanced. If you know of this like wings, the side parts is too large. So if A minus B and B minus A, more than two percent. Yeah. And we have this notion uh, um, that's uh, a strongly sublinear separator. Like we had like the graph class three has strongly sublinear separators. Separators if there's some constant C and de C and delta greater than zero such that for every graph in this graph class, there exists a balanced separator of order at most c times the number of vertices of the graph to one minus delta. So it's like sublinear here. Okay, there's some constant in which is inverse of the graph class, and the order is the size of this set. Okay. Order is the size of the intersection. Okay, that's the order. Yeah, so you can cut the graph into balanced pieces uh, using something that's sublinear up here. Okay. And now the, um, what I tried to sketch at the end of the lecture, but I didn't have the computations ready, so I want to do them correctly today, uh, was that, hey, uh, what's the, I mean, so strongly sublinear separator is that you can split the graph into balanced parts and uh, that are like smaller, that are smaller, that are multiplicatively smaller using a small number of vertices. And what's very intuitive to do is to do it recursively. I mean, try to split the graph into smaller and smaller pieces. We have this like binary tree of decomposition to tiny and tiny pieces. So we'll see how it ends, or we'll see uh, what we can get out of it. That's the main point of the today lecture. So, yep. So what I want to have here is that I want to now make a slightly different definition. So in this graph class, all the graph classes we consider, they're usually closed under leading vertices. So like they're hereditary, they're closed under taking new subgraphs. They're usually closed even under taking subgraphs, but right? new subgraphs, that's essentially a minimum to almost everything we talked about. Uh, so I want now to discuss a single graph. So I want to say that the graph G has hereditary, hereditary strongly subdivided separators. So th this happens for all the induced subgraphs. So there exists C and delta greater than zero, such that for all subgraphs, so for each set of vertices, let's call it B, uh, there exists the balance separator of the induced subgraph, G of B, of size at most C, size of B to one minus delta. Yeah, so these are hereditary strong sublinear separators, okay? And that's like we take a graph and we assume that for some CN data it has got hereditary strong sublinear separators and we'll see what happens. I mean, if we have got a graph class that's closed under new subgraphs, closed under vertex division, and has got strong linear separators, then all the graphs class have got hereditary strong sublinear separators because all the new subgraphs are in the same graph class. But that's like the notion, I mean, we will, we will somehow depart from the idea of thinking of a graph class now we have got one graph, but we know that however we delete the vertices, we still have got a balanced separator, and the size of this balanced separator has got this size of the thing we try to delete to one minus delta. It's not the original graph, but the size of the thing we, we want to delete. There. Okay, good. So that's our code. So now let's try to uh, do the following operation that I mimicked previously. That's like, let's try, let's fix some Prescott lambda. Let's fix some Prescott lambda. And let's start with the graph, let's make this decomposition. So we start with the graph G, this is like P of G. And we look at 
this graph and apply the apply the the fact that the graph has so we assume that the graph has hereditary strongly sublinear separators. We have got this constant c and delta, and we just hit the graph with the sub with the sublinear separator and like do this recursively. Yeah, so we apply this uh, strongly sublinear separator. So we get the fact that this graph really looks like that. This a and b, okay, and we decompose into two parts. There will be like a part a and part b. Yeah, so the common part will be copied into the box, box G plane, okay? And then we take now G of A and apply the strong sublinear separator to parts left and right, and again partition into left and right. Okay, so this is like some A1, B1, this is A1, B1, B1, yeah? And with this recursion, we stop at least when the set of, when the corresponding set A is at most lambda. So we stop when the corresponding set reaches size lambda, we stop. Lambda is our first call when we stop. So we don't want to apply it for two tiny uh, sets because it, as we see in the computation at the moment, it won't make much sense to do it first. I mean, computation start to break down. I mean, if this, uh, like, this, this expression starts to be like, I mean, at some moment, this expression starts to be larger than size of D. I mean, if one D reaches something like comparable to, mm, comparable to C, or like C to the one over delta, this starts to be larger than D, and it, this notion starts to stop to make sense, okay? So what I, let's, let's check what it really says. So let's, let's, let's make exactly this computation that I just think. So what we have got, we have got this something of size, say, at, at some moment of size n, okay? So we have got some set, set of size n, and we split it into balanced separators. This is A, this is B, and we know that this part is at most two parts n, this part is at most two parts n, okay, and this part is at most uh, like this side, like c times n to the one minus delta. Yeah? That happens when we do the sublinear separators. So let's compute what's the size of a. So the size of a, well, this is the this is like the left part plus the common part. Yeah, and this part is two parts n, and this part is. Uh, C n to the one minus delta, okay? And now what I want to compute, I want to make a small computation saying, hey, when this is still multiplicatively smaller, we want this process to have like depth log m. We want this process to, at every step, multiplicatively shrink the instances that are there. So say we want this to be, say, smaller than three quarters n, which means that we want C n to the one minus delta to be smaller than one twelfth n, if I can subtract the numbers correctly. I think it's fine, one two. And now we do the computation, that means that, uh, oh, this is the wrong complicated one, that n to the delta needs to be larger than, uh, n to the delta needs to be larger than 12c, which means that n needs to be larger than 12c to 1 over delta. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so we need the stress code to be at least 12c. 1 over delta, which is like a constant. If c and delta is a constant, this is a constant. Yeah? Because it's 12, the constant in front of the sublinear separators to like the inverse of the gain, like it's how sublinear it is. Okay, so we want to have this constant, and then at every step we shrink by a factor of these three quarters, and yeah, that's like, like the, that's the moment when you stop to shrink. Yeah, if the things become like a huge constant, I mean, this notion of sublinear separators starts to not say anything reasonable about the size of the separator. So that's the time computation we made here. Yeah, but now, I mean, now the point is that in this picture, we have duplicated some things, yeah? And now we want to like control how much we duplicate stuff. So how, to what extent we duplicate stuff, because we don't want this one to grow very large, okay? So let's try to make, let's try to count duplications, and the duplications, how we will count them, will count the total size of leaves, okay? That's like, that's like the total size of leaves is the original vertex graph plus all the duplications we made on the way there. Yeah, because here we duplicated something, we duplicated something, and like if we sum up all the leaves, that will be like the original number of vertices plus the, all the duplications on the way there. Okay, so our goal now is to compute the total sum called com estimate the sum over uh, A, which is leaf, or D, let's call it D, leaf, of the decomposition, the size of it. Okay? 
So let's look a little bit further. So because of this one, let's because of this one, because of this one, we have got that the first observation is that at level i of the tree, i of the tree, the size of e is smaller than the three quarters i times the original size. So we call the original size n. So this is like the notion here, but okay, this is called the original size n, which is the size of the original graph. Yeah, capital. Yeah, so at a level i, I mean, we shrink at every level by a factor of three quarters, so we shrink down, down to this part. Okay? Now, if we look at a child, uh, we have a guy and we have uh, some children. Mm. Okay, so we have, let's look at the. Mm. So we want to. Mm. Okay, so what, what's the growth? I mean, let's look, I want to look at <coughs> multiplicativity, yeah? So if there's some guy of size, if there's some set of B, of size, size of B, it's got two children, and the size A and size B, and of course size A plus size B is smaller than size B plus C times size D to the one minus that. Yeah, I mean, that's like the, uh, that's, I mean, that's the, oh, I mean, that's like the, I mean, this is the part we duplicated, yeah? the separator is the part we duplicated. So let me do the computation here. So let me repeat it. A plus B is smaller than like, we copied C is D to the one in delta. And I want to think of this in the multiplicative fashion. So I want to have size of D times one plus C, size of D to one minus delta. Okay? So at every level, we multiplied, uh, we multiply like the we, 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 the leaves, the total size of leaves at, at, of one child is like the parent times this factor, which is one plus c to the delta. I, mean, I just did, did the math here. So what I want to say here is that uh, the sum of our leaves, size of d, is bounded like you start with all the vertices of the graph, then at level one, this is, uh, Mm, at level one, this is uh, mm, at level one. This is uh, like this this size. At level two, this is like this times the next one. So let me write it. So let's call this number an i. Give this number an i. So I want to say that this is sum from i equal to zero to the height of the tree, to height of the tree. Uh, I mean, there's like this number of vertices of the graph in front of it, times one plus C times n i the minus delta uh, product. Okay, this is like the important way, the important how to understand how we estimate it. Yeah, at the top level there are n vertices. Okay, at the second level there's like n times one plus c times n zero, and zero is n. Yeah, to the minus delta by this inequality. At the second level, this is like the previous level, so n times one plus c times n zero times this multiplicative factor from the second level. So times one plus c times n one to the minus delta, etc. Okay? So like at every level we multi the total size of the things get multiplied by this one when this is the top estimate how big the powers are at the start. Uh, actually this is mm. actually I'm worried a bit because I mean if the parts yeah those are smaller than this one. Okay. So now, uh, what I want to do here is that I want now to make this estimation. So how do I estimate these things? Well, this is the mm -hmm, I mean, e to the minus stuff, yeah? e to the sum uh, from y to e zero to height of the tree, c times n i to the minus delta. And this is standard one plus x smaller than e to the x, okay? And this is, now the point is that this one this one is uh, mm, this one is the mm, uh, this one is the mm, this is this is really the geometric series, yeah. So we have got like three quarters, and they're like smaller and smaller numbers. But we take a negative power, so like the smallest number is the larger one. That's why this is like geometric series. So it's really like the last factor, the nth part, is the dominating one because we want. 
This is like one over something to the delta. Yeah, this is like less than one factor. So the last guy is the dominating one. So this is uh, mm, okay, what's some different constant, since n h to the minus delta. So this is like the bottom one. Yeah? And this is roughly lambda. Yeah? We stop at level lambda. Yeah, because I mean we never chop off more than two thirds of them. We always like uh, it's roughly the roughly of this size, like I mean not the roughly of the size, but like uh, if we reach level lambda, we don't suddenly shrink to tiny fraction of lambda because uh, I mean we always chop that only at most two thirds of the further size. Yeah, so the at the least we are between lambda and one third lambda. So this is roughly lambda, okay? So this is roughly lambda. Uh, this is roughly lambda, so we want this one, and we want the growth to be tiny. So uh, if you want this one to be smaller than plus one plus epsilon times n, or some tiny epsilon, if you want the growth to be like tiny compared to the original size, so like the total size of leaves to be slightly larger than the original size, to have this one, we need, uh, uh, what we need here, I mean, we can say that this is really Let's write it this one, n times one plus uh, some constant C double hat times lambda to the minus delta, okay? This is like, mm, I mean, because this is roughly lambda and like e to the x is roughly one plus x for tiny, for tiny numbers, uh, if we're looking for tiny numbers uh, up there. So, I mean, this is assuming that this is like less than half or something like that. So th if you want this one to be, uh, if we want this one to be, uh, epsilon we need lambda to be roughly one over epsilon to the one over delta. Yeah, then this will be uh, then this will be epsilon, and because this roughly means like uh, use all of this ones so that the, this there's huge constant in front of it to kill this c double hat hat here. Okay, so you want lambda to be like one over delta to one one over epsilon to one over delta, and if you want this, then if we have this one, then this is smaller than n times one of plus epsilon, okay? And uh, uh, for this number, and now, so we have now here, if we go back here, this, we also assume that this is some huge constant times one over epsilon, one over delta. And like this is, if we want tiny epsilon here, and we we'll want tiny epsilon, this is like the dominative over this way. It is some constant to one over delta, this one over epsilon to one over delta. So this is like the, the dominant request here, up here, yeah? So what I made here in estimation, we have this process of sweetening, we stop at some level, this is still for fixed epsilon, for fixed delta, there's still a constant, huge constant, but still, and we have to prove that the total duplication in the process is at most epsilon the original size of the graph, okay? And yeah, that's what we really wanted here. Okay. So this is the this is in a sense like the cheapest version of this uh, whole process. So let me do some uh, um, hand wavy sketching here. We can do the same process, but not with the uniform weight over vertices. This is like very hand wavy, just to point, indicate the direction. Uh, the notion of balance separator makes out of sense if you don't because here in some sense the measure is the uniform measure when every vertex has weight one. And the total weight of the blob is n the number of vertices. Yeah, but you can think of any positively, I mean, any non-negative measure on the vertices, any measure on the vertices of the graph. And here the request is that the leaves, that is this, not leaves, the wings, this a minus b and b minus f, is at most two thirds the total weight of the graph. So like there we, here we chopped up most two thirds the total weight of the entire graph. And but still the number of vert still the size of the separator counts in number of vertices. So the balanced separator counts the number of vertices, but what does it mean to be balanced is defined in terms of weights. That this part is at most two thirds of everything, and this part is most two thirds of everything. And the proof from the previous lecture worked exactly the same. I mean, there's like, uh, like the guys of bounded uh, the guys of polynomial expansion have got balanced separator in this weighted variant that if you give a graph and the weight distribution of the vertices, there is a balanced separator, so separator of this size, so still the size of the separator, separator in terms of number of vertices, but the balancedness is in terms of weight. I mean, the, the size of weight. So with this balanced separators, what you can do, you can do this separation, you can do this process up here, but like every few steps, if like if you look at this step and you mark new red, say, 
you mark in red all the guys that were shared, like the boundary of the set. Yeah? You can think of the boundary of the set as these guys that were copied from the hill. So here, the boundary is these guys. These guys can have some edges to some rest of the graph. Then when you copy the boundary with the previous boundary and the new boundary. Yeah? So here, the boundary frame B will be the copy of this one and the trace of this one. Okay? And this boundary can be more and more because you collect this boundary from all the ancestors in your tree. But at, every st at some moment, instead of splitting the size of the graph, you can split the boundary. You can put like uniform weight, but only on the boundary. So that the interior vertices have got weight zero and the boundary vertices have got weight one. So that if the boundary grows too many, you can make a step in this decomposition of splitting the boundary, not splitting the interior. Okay? And this model can get an extra property that not only the, there's a like, mm, on average, the boundary is small because the total number of duplication is like epsilon n or whatever, but you can like keep the, in the process that uh, even every piece, like if you look at the piece itself, its local boundary is small because if it grows too large, you make a step of splitting the boundary into smaller pieces. So you can even keep the boundary of the order of the size of the separation. Yeah? This is the size of the separation, I mean, there's n. So whenever the boundary grows like, well, like I don't know, 100 times this one, you split into two reasonable pieces, and the 100 drops down to like 67, because you get rid of like, the machine to two thirds. And you, on you, and you put in the middle only one, so it's like 68. I mean, you always shrink it. Uh, so, mm, yep, so you can internally these steps and you can make this thing powerful. We presented like the cheapest version here because that's sufficient for the application. I will be presenting here in a moment, but it's important to understand that this frame is quite powerful and you can make a number of tricks with them, with the main trick being like, sometimes using some different weighting for the bar separators, not necessarily splitting the vertices, but like splitting boundary vertices or splitting some other objects that are important for your problem out there in the, in the process. Okay, you can also in some points stop this process much earlier, like stop at the level, I don't know, when lambda is root n or something like that, or log poly log n, it makes sense for some applications. For us today, this is the correct place to stop. Good. Okay, so this is, we proved uh, this one. So we proved that if we stop this recursive process at this level, the total overhead, the total duplication is like epsilon times the number of vertices, and that will be important for us uh, in a moment. Okay, good. I'm wiping out everything because I want to change the topic. I mean, I'm not change the topic, but like now make use of it. Use this one. that um, now what we do, uh, we want really to, um, yep, so let's solve the problem. Let's, we're working on the problem of our dominators. Yes, so we want, to, we have a graph C and we want to select some set of vertices as small as possible, minimize x such that Everybody is within distance r from x. This is the graph key. So everybody is within some of r from x. Okay? Yep. So that's our goal. That's our dominating set. And we want to make approximation. This is an NP hard problem. So what we want to do, we want to assume that g has g is from graph of g has hereditary hereditary strongly sublinear separators. So the separators are like c times size of the graph one of the delta, and we have got this compass times del C delta. So in particular, it may come from some whole graph, graph of the polynomial expansion, and then we have got this from the polynomial expansion. And what we want to say, we want to, the theorem, what we want to say is that for some, um, so the theorem I will phrase in the following fashion, and I will explain what does it mean, because that will be probably under, not understood by some of you. For some lambda, and this is not, uh, okay, let's put it L. 
That is what we think of this as almost the same as the lambda projective, or some L thing order of one over epsilon one over delta. Radius L local search. Local search for our dominating set gives one plus epsilon approximation. And yeah, so there's some definition like for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, there is some means L of this order such that radius gives one plus epsilon approximation. So what does it mean? What, what did I say here? So the first two lines should be simple, like for every epsilon, there is some number of this num of this size, such that blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's a local search? How to try to find an R dominating set? So start with any, yeah? So start, like, like pick any dominating set. So let's start with X. So let's make the following algorithm. While, uh, look. so this is loop. So let's say X is somebody, uh, V of G is a great, uh, V of G is a good R dominating set, yeah? So loop. While uh, there exists a set Z inside the D of G, size at most uh, our radius L, yeah, uh, such that uh, such that uh, uh, so this is like our loop, yeah. While such that if we so Z is the modification to S such that x triangle z. So this is like symmetric difference, yeah? Some z guys are the guys to delete from the x, some guys to add new, such that x z is an L dominating set. And x triangle z is strictly smaller than x, then replace. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we have this loop. This is like just the whole algorithm. Wow. So we have got our group G, and we have picked some vertices. Our, our dominating set, we start with some trivial one, but while we can make some improvement by removing a few guys from here and putting a few new, and this is like uh, for L equal five, yeah? We removed three and we add two more. This like this five guys is the set Z, yeah? So X is the set X, and now, okay, so we make a symmetric difference, so we remove these three guys and add these two new, and this is still an R dominating set, and the new size is smaller because we removed more than we added new, then we improve it, okay? Otherwise, we stop. If we didn't find any such improvement, we stop. This is some algorithm to find some R dominating set, okay? This is called the radius R local search, yeah? We try to make change on of size at most L, like the humming distance between these two sets is at most L, and we try to uh, improve the the side of the dominating set keeping it an R dominating set. Okay? Of course, this is not guaranteed in general to find reasonable. I mean, if you take the radius to be the size of the graph, it will explore the entire space, and yeah, that's fine. But otherwise, if for L like 5 or whatever, it will produce some maybe reasonable dominating set, but we don't know how reasonable. Okay? So this is this is called radius L local search. And a solution that can be output by this one is called a local optimum, a radius and local optimum, a local optimum. Yeah, a local means that there is some solution that cannot be improved by changing at most L vertices. Yeah, this is a, a local optimum. So local search is some algorithm that, I mean, it really heavily depends on in which order it looks for the Z, it goes through the space of the solutions for the R dominating set and at some moment outputs the, uh, some local optimum, some L local optimum, yeah? I mean, of course, this algorithm finishes, uh, I mean, the number of loops is bounded by N because at every step it shrinks the size of the solution. And this step, I mean, this is like size something like N to the L and like the check is linear, so this, is, this algorithm runs in time N to the L plus whole one, yeah? I mean, so there's like, there's some polynomial yeah. overhead that I wouldn't want to analyze, but the main factor is this n to the l exploring all the possible swaps here. Okay? So this is the running time of this algorithm, and um, yeah, so this is the local search. And now what we are really saying here, we are one plus epsilon approximate, what we are really saying here, we are saying here, hey, 
if you run the local search algorithm for L being this huge constant, but this is a constant, so this is a polynomial yeah. for fixed epsilon, fixed delta. This is a constant, yeah? Okay, you will end up with, a, of course, local optimum, a local optimum, because that's how local search lives, and this is guaranteed to be one plus epsilon approximation, which means that this is a guarantee that the output size is bounded by one plus epsilon times the optimum output size. Yeah, so if you look at what's the best possible dominating set, I mean, we will not return the optimum one, but we'll return only one of plus epsilon times, times larger, okay? So this is like an accuracy parameter. Somebody gives us, hey, you have this graph, you know the C and delta, well, if I want 1% one, 1 approximation, then there's like this 100 to the 1 over delta, uh, right, this local search will give me like 1% approximation, like one, not, not larger than 1% than the, than, than the optimum solution, okay? So this is really, I mean, this looks like an algorithmic statement, but this is really a graph theoretical statement. <laughs> this is a statement saying every L local search <laughs> optimum is a 1 plus epsilon approximation, because we have here no control on how this local search will like explore this set of Zs or how it will find out that, yeah? So what we really want to prove, to prove such a statement, is the graph theoretical statement. If something is, or like every L local optimum is an one plus epsilon approximation, or if the better way of saying it, or the better way of thinking about this, if something is much larger than the optimum solution, something that is more than one plus epsilon than the optimum solution, then you can find a radius L local search, you can find this local swap, this swapping at most L vertices, that will actually improve the solution, okay? That's the way to think it. If something is much larger than the, than the opti op optimum solution, then there's actually a way of improving it by changing only a little, only like one up over epsilon to one over delta, guys. Okay, that's what we are going to prove. So the, issue, the intuition is as follows. The intuition is as follows. If uh, we use this hierarchical partition, and the intuition is as follows. If something is not an approximation, so it's not a good approximation, then there's actually one leaf of the recursion when like swapping what's in the leaf to what optimum does in the leaf is actually is a, a good move. But let's do let's do it slow. Okay, so that's like so I hope the goal is now clean, what we want to get here. Good. Okay, so let us uh, so we won't do, the point is that, uh, okay. Mm. Ha, ha, ha. I think I screwed, I was over optimistic now. Sorry for that. I will be, sorry, I will be, uh, I will be, sorry, I'm go back. I will, I need to use that this is uh, of like uh, some, some polynomial expansion. Sorry, I'm sorry for that one. I thought I need to do it, but this is not really. Uh, I will use this one in the proof. I will show you. I will use the plugins of polynomial expansion. So let's do the polynomial expansion. Sorry for that. I just realized uh, I missed one step, which is important. Because I don't want to apply the strongly subnormal separators exactly to the G3. I want to modify it a bit. Okay. So let's run our algorithm and let's. So our algorithm produces some solution. So let's. Uh, in the end, it ends with some x. So our algorithm, a local search, ends with, with x, okay? And there's also an optimum solution which we'll call y. y is an optimum solution. Okay, it's one optimum solution. And these are both our dominating sets. Now we need to use the fact that we are solving our dominating set. This won't be like a true for any problem we imagine. So how does our dominating set work? Our dominating set, uh, you can think of the solution. I mean, I want not only to think of the solution, but I want to think of like who does everybody dominate. Yeah, so I, what I want to do is that for every, mm, let's do the following for every, mm, for every uh, this one for x, let's make some arbitrary order. So let's v1, let's do v and the arbitrary order of v of g. And let's for every v inside v of g, uh, pick pi of v, and this is like pi x or pi y. So 
the work. Yeah? This is the closest to the vertex of x, and you break ties by this order, breaking tie by the order. This break ties. So I want some tie breaking rule, yeah? So uh, some like global tie breaking rule. And the same like closest guy. Closest to vertex of y. Yeah? So Everybody has got somebody within the radius R, but I want to actually point to somebody who is dominating me. And I want to point always to the closest guy and break ties in some global way. Why this is important for me? Why this is important for me is that I want like every vertex from X to have its own cluster who it's dominate. Yeah? So there's the entire graph. Yeah, and this is like X. And like by this manner, really, if you look at the guys, like pi minus one of this guy, like this, this is the guys, so this is the guy x, then this is like the guys, this v, like pi x or v is x, yeah? This area, so it's really partitioned everything into like connected regions, like that, yeah? So partition the graph into regions, this is like, you can think of them as like Voronoi cells, really, of this solution, but whatever. And it's really like, there's really like a spanning tree here. This is the shortest path to look at the spanning tree because if this guy here chose this guy as the closest one, then all the way guys on the shortest path also need to choose this guy. I mean, there cannot be anybody closer. There cannot be anybody closer here or earlier in the, earlier in the order because otherwise this guy will choose this guy, not this guy to, to, to be the leader. Yeah? So if this guy chose this one to be in his cluster, then uh, mm, the, this whole spanning tree of shortest paths also to this one as a cluster, yeah? So we call this the cluster of x, cluster in the solution x of x, okay? So like I want, what I did here is that by breaking ties which guys are more preferable, everybody on the, in the graph chooses uh, his vertex from the solution, mm, he closes vertex solution or breaking ties by this order, to be in his cluster, and um, uh, like so, every guy from the solution has his cluster, and these clusters are both in the our solution we found and in the optimum solution. Yeah, so there are x clusters and y clusters here. Okay, and these are like these are of radius at most r because the shortest paths are at most r. Okay, so we have got what you think what we can think of this is like in some sense you have got like two depth r minors here, like if you take the solution x. And like this, take these clusters, contract them. This will be like depth R minor. And the other part will be also a depth R minor. Okay, if you do this for Ys, which I didn't draw at the same time. So now, what I want really to do is that I don't want to think of them as two separate minors. I want to think of them as the one minor of ply or congestion too. We had this notion of minors of congestion, yeah? That you don't, it's not that every, the branches are disjoint, but every vertex can be used in the most two or C, like congestion number of branches, yeah? I want to think of this one as a congestion to minor, or depth ply to minor, okay? So that every vertex can be used one in a cluster of X and once in a cluster of Y, and I have got this one huge depth R ply to minor, yeah? So what I want to say is that this cluster, so cluster CX plus CY, give me a depth R ply to minor. Okay, so if I do this once, I get this minor here, and so now two two branches are connected if they overlap or if they're connected by an edge. Yeah, that was the definition. And we had I was lecturing some time ago. There was quite a complicated proof how the nablas behave. So I, especially for you, because I never remember this formula. I wrote it down here. So we have this lemma that I remember proving here like three months ago, that if H is a depth uh, E ply C minor of G, okay, so this is like depth E ply minor of G, then uh, what is this? Uh, uh -huh. uh, then, uh, that's T, sorry, this is T, then nabla D of H, so you are now taking D, de depth D minors of something that was depth T minor of ply C, okay? So we had this formula, there was like 
something depending on C. This is this density from the fact that this like depth t ply c minor ply c minor is really a minor, a real minor of g g is this product kc. Yeah? If you blow up every vertex in the click of size c, this is this, I mean, and then to take a normal depth t minor, this is the same as looking at ply. Yeah? So this c corresponds to the density of this clicks with plugging here. And then there was the other factor that was, so we compared to nabla, uh, and there was the natural nabla here, which was 2 dt plus d plus t. This is like the radius you can get if you take first something of radius t, and then something of radius d after the contraction, then the radius at which you can see something is like this one, so this is so d. And there was a factor in front of it, which was 2c squared times 2 dt plus d plus t plus 1 squared. That was the factor we got. Okay, that's what it denotes. Uh, d, d plus t, okay, yeah. So let's understand it, what does it mean, yeah? So this is depth t minor, so this is this radius r. So what's in our setting here? This c is 2, so c is some constant, ignore c, c doesn't matter. t is our radius of the dominating set, okay? This is what we contract here. t is our radius of the dominating set, so this is again a constant, because we are solving one particular radius pi of the dominating set. Okay, the important part is that we are looking at the nablas of this graph, of this graph, of, of this graph, yeah, of this graph after contracting these clusters, yeah. This is our graph H, yeah. And we want to see what are the properties here. The original graph was of polynomial expansion, yeah. So this is polynomial in this factor when the d is my radius. Now important radius, d is my important radius. So this is linear in the radius, and I have got nabla here. So this is polynomial in d. This is polynomial in d. Okay. And this is a quadratic polynomial in D, okay? So if this was a polynomial expansion, this is a polynomial expansion, but the degree, degree went up by two, okay? If we had the degree um, sigma here, okay, this one would have the degree sigma plus two, okay? This is again polynomial, but of slightly high degree, okay? So now what we get, yeah? So this H is from another graph class, it's not from the original graph class, but if the original graph class was about the expansion, a polynomial expansion, this one will be also polynomial expansion, but the degree of the polynomial will be, will be like a plus two, at least according to our proof we got there. Okay? So H of polynomial expansion, and now we want to use strong something in our separators from H. Okay? So the previous lecture said that if you have got polynomial expansion with exponent sigma, then the delta for the polynomial separator, you can take one over four sigma plus three. That was that was the thing that was from the previous lecture. I don't know if I was explicit with that one with the proof. If you look into the notes with the correct computations up there, I may be sloppy the previous week, but you can get sigma plus three. So now we have the polynomial expansion of sigma plus two, which means that here will be plus eleven. Okay? So if the polynomial expansion, if the original sigma of the graph class was the ex exponent was sigma then h was, has sigma plus 2, so we have got 4 sigma plus 11. Here. Okay. Yeah, so that's our polynomial expansion. So we have got our polynomial expansion, so we have this constant c times um, 2 1 minus delta, this is like the size of our separator, and now we want to do our decomposition, but of the graph h. And now the graph h, to be important, is this like double layer graph, when, uh, which is like this depth r applied to minor, when the vertices are like the clusters of the guys either from the solution or from the optimum solution, either from the approximate solution or the optimum solution. And now the intuition what we want to do here is that, hey, let's take this graph and do this decomposition up to depth lambda for some chosen lambda, roughly this one over psi of one over delta, okay? And, uh, mm, get to the point and let's look at the single cluster. And the intuition will be, hey, in a single cluster, we cannot have too much disproportion between the X and Y clusters uh, in a single cell of this decomposition, of the decomposition, because that would give us a good swap. Let's now understand what, what I just said. So we go back here. Mm. Yep. So, uh, what 
what we want to say here, like let's pick some Psylon and what we had uh, in the previous, uh, what we had transported for some lambda in order of one over epsilon, one over delta, which is by this one, this is like epsilon, epsilon to minus four sigma plus 11, where sigma is the, expo is the exponent of the polynomial expansion of the graph class, okay? We can get the, we get the, this here has a composition which I would call say lambda division. This is this here has a composition. With this property that the sum over all leaves, I don't think at most one plus epsilon times the number of vertices. Yeah, so this is like the original. Yeah, so the number of vertices that is the number of vertices. And this is like the number of vertices is really the size of x plus the size of y. Yep, I mean, there's a vertex for an x class and a vertex for, for the y class, okay? So now epsilon times this one, this is like a good thing, yeah? Epsilon times this one is like epsilon times the total size of our two solutions. So this is like the error, more or less the error we can allow ourselves, okay? So fix some, so we can rare at this point. So now the, let's look at one leaf. So let's look at one leaf. Let's look at one leaf, and let's um, do the following operation, okay? So th there's this leaf. So this leaf, uh, I will draw it, this leaf has got some things from the X clusters, some clusters from the same Y. So there are some clusters up here from the X. There are some clusters from the Y, okay? So this is like the, this leaf, okay? And some of them are the boundary guys. So these guys are the repeated guys, boundary. What, what is H? H is this graph we constructed here. So we took, we took here. Uh, mm, but the vertices of H are clusters? Yes, are clusters. Okay. So we, and what we took, this is this depth here? R apply to minor. So we take, took our original graph. Okay. And as you can think of it, like we duplicated every vertex into like an X copy and the Y copy. And now contract the on the x layer, contract the x cluster, and the y layer contract the y cluster. So h is after contraction. After contraction, yes. Okay. So like every vertex here corresponds to the cluster before. Okay. Uh, so we have got this thing, and this guy is the guys that are on band. Let's call this the boundary guys. Okay. So this is the this is the x guys. This is the y guys, and there are the boundary guys. These are the guys that were copied on the way here. So these are the guys that know somebody outside this cluster. So this is the cluster D. D. There are some vertices, this, there's this leaf, I will call it a cell. Let's call it a cell. This, this is this cell up here. It has got some vertices corresponding to X clusters, some vertices corresponding to Y clusters, and there are some boundary vertices that, cor that are the vertices that neighbor somebody outside. Okay? Good. So what I want to say here is that, hey, uh, Okay, so there's the boundary, so let's call the boundary like delta D. This is delta D, and there's like D, this is D times C, this is like CX part of the CY pass. And what I want to say here is that I want to, Im to improve X. In a sense, the intuition is that I want to, hey, what will happen if inside, if, like in these clusters, I will make X behave like the optimum solution. The optimum solution is supposed to be better, so let's try to locally swap x with, with swap what how x behaves here with how y behaves here but the point is that you can't really in our domain set make a very local change because i mean there's some vertices like on the boundary of what you change that make it through that okay so what i want to say here is that observation the crucial observation is the following let's take x so let's define x has to be x and I want to replace these guys with all these guys, okay? So I want to remove D intersection X, D intersection X minus the boundary of D, so D minus the boundary of D intersection X. So I want to ignore the there, but introduce all Ys. So this was, but add all Ys. 
Yep. So the idea is as follows. Instead of these guys, I want all these guys. And I want to claim that this is also a dominant piece and our dominant piece. Okay, why? Hey, why this is an r dominating set? Let's look at the original graph. Remember, these were the clusters after contracting the vertices, okay? So I, at the, at the beginning, x was an r dominating set, okay? Then I removed some guys from x, okay? Then I removed some guys from x, which means that some guys stopped to be dominating. Which are these guys? These are the guys that are inside these clusters that I, that I, in the interior of the, they are not the boundary guys, okay? So if you look at the, if you now expand D to the entire graph, let's expand this, this level to the entire graph, yeah? There are somewhere, yeah, these are the, these are this, this four guys, yeah? And these two guys are somewhere here. And these two guys can have some edges outside. So these are the boundary guys, and these are the interior guys, yeah? Because this was like the original graph after, the contra after we contracted all the clusters, I mean, these this clusters can have edges outside, but these guys can't have any edges outside, okay? And now, these guys in this contracted graph have only neighbors here. I mean, this is like, in this contracted graph, the edges go only from here. So these guys may have edges towards this one, or this one, but not outside this, this, this cell, okay? So, what does it mean an edge between an, an X class and a Y class? So this is an overlap, yeah? I mean, we, we duplicate every vertex in the click, and then this is an overlap or an edge between the clusters, okay? So now the point is that, hey, uh, this, what does it mean then is that this guy, that mm, an overlap, I mean, these vertices are dominated in the Y solution by these vertices in these clusters. All these vertices in these clusters are in these clusters because an overlap if there's a vertex in this cluster and this cluster, there's an edge in, the, in, this, in this graph. But this is like, this guy's in the interior, they're not the boundary. So all these clusters cover all these clusters. Because like an overlap between clusters is an edge between the clusters. Okay? So all these clusters cover all these clusters, which means that what we added here, we added all the guys below, dominate the guys that we dominate the clusters of what we removed. Okay, that's the crucial observation. So now, okay, mm. yep, now the point is that, hey, uh, now this, um, yep, this, I mean, what I want to say here is that, hey, uh, now let's make the computation, yes, we did this one, but I want to say that, hey, if this is tiny operation, yeah, I mean, how large are the sizes? How large are the sizes? So this, we had this observation, yeah, that this, is still an R-dominating set, okay? This is still an R-dominating set, and the important part here is now, hey, but this is a small swap, this is a radius L step, yeah? Because this one, this entire cluster is of size lambda, okay? So this swap, so D intersection Y plus D intersection X plus D intersection X, which is like really the size of D, this is smaller than lambda. Yeah, because we took the lambda division, we reached this one single cell, okay? So the checking if this one is not smaller than this one is then lambda local search step. Yeah, checking if x hat is not, I mean, this is like a something that the lambda local search step will check. When we're removing this guys and adding this guys, hey, it's an r dominating set, maybe it's smaller, and if it's smaller, it will improve. So we'll have, because this lambda dominating set, we have that the x hat is larger than x. Yep. I mean, this thing doesn't improve. This thing cannot improve the size of the solution. Cannot decrease the size of the solution because it's a swap that the local search thing, uh, uh, the local search algorithm tries to make. Okay, because it's small. It's happening in something of size radius of the local search. Okay. So what I want to say now is that let's now. So here is the operation. Let's now probably end up with some computations. Okay, so let's end up with the computation. The computation is that, hey, what does it mean? That means that what we remove is always smaller than what we add, yeah? So d minus sigma d intersection x is always 
not larger than what we add. Okay? Yeah? Um, so now, okay, one cluster, we don't know what happens in one cluster, but now we can sum over, we have the average estimate, yeah? So now we can sum this one over our clusters. This happens in every cluster. So let's sum over our DD. DD. And well, here we count disjoint parts of X. Okay, here we count disjoint parts of X. This is smaller. Uh, the, no, this is the, uh, yes, we have, sorry. No, that's not the thing. Uh, e minus sigma D X smaller than sum over D D D D D D Y. Okay, now, uh, so this is what I know, and now I want to say, hey, uh, I mean, now I need to add the fact that the boundary is small, yeah? I mean, the boundary is small. So this is x minus the boundary, yeah? We didn't count the boundary, yeah? So this is like, uh, what I want to say is that this is larger than x minus the boundary, minus the total boundary, and the total boundary is epsilon size of the graph, minus epsilon size of x plus x, y. Okay, yeah, so I counted everybody that's inside. So this is the entire X minus the, everything that was duplicated. And here I overcount this guy. So this is smaller than Y plus epsilon size of X plus X of Y. Yeah, so here I overcount the boundary and here I don't count the boundary. So I make the adjustments. I estimated how I lose on the boundary. So what I get here is that, uh, let's make the, so I make I get something like x times one minus two epsilon uh, yeah, is smaller than uh, y times one plus two epsilon, which means that size of x smaller than size of y times something to one plus two epsilon over one minus two epsilon, which means that if I started with not epsilon but epsilon over ten, this would be like smaller than one plus epsilon. Yeah, I did epsilon at the beginning but somebody gave him a accuracy he wanted, and I could have started the algorithm like, hey, you wanted 1% accuracy, I will start with 1% over a 10, like divide the accuracy by 10, do the entire algorithm, and realize that I have got this guarantee, and this is the guarantee we wanted. The size of the local search solution is bounded by the optimum solution times some factor, and it's like one plus two epsilon over one minus two epsilon. And now epsilon would have been the intended epsilon over 10, this would be like smaller than one plus epsilon which we have started by dividing the epsilon by 10. Okay? And like, yeah. So we have what we did. Let's recap what really happened here, uh, because that's like the important uh, uh, property. Uh, yeah, what happened here? Well, we started with a graph of polar expansion. Sorry for the mess up. I somehow got confused that we can do it for hereditary sublinear separators. Now we need to apply it for a different graph. Uh, we wanted, to, the, this is like, this is not, our, and we wanted to solve the R dominating set. And we not only proved that there is a one plus epsilon approximation is possible in polynomial time for fixed epsilon, which is a polynomial time approximation scheme, if you know. But we proved something much more. We proved that the local search algorithm, which is like one of the simplest way of approximating, I mean, you can define local search for almost all optimization problems, or like, for a lot of optimization problems, you can define local search. So we proved that this simple heuristic, which is something used in practice in many places, like how to do local search with some other thing, is actually a good approximation in this regime. That if we have got a graph of polynomial expansion, and we if we have got a polynomial expansion, and we have got, uh, mm, and we want to solve our dominating set. Yep. And what we did, well, we wanted to use our divisions. This is like a common team in many things. Take the correct graph, make our division, and argue that in a site every cell, you can somehow swap the optimum solution, the local search solution with the optimum solution by like paying the boundary, like double counting the boundary or something like that. And then in total, the boundary is small and the swap never is profitable because this local search and the cells are small. Yep, the cells are small. So, I mean, so you have got your guarantee that in a sense, what the local search solution cannot do is that it cannot fix the boundary, but inside every inside every cell it does the optimum it does in the optimum way. Okay, and that's what happened here. So we took 
Uh, we took the uh, lambda division that we developed earlier, so that the total size of the boundary is only epsilon of the, of the graph. And here, the important part is that we didn't use the original graph because we don't have any guarantee how does the solution, I mean, epsilon times n is something meaningless for the original graph in terms of approximation factor. We don't know how much the solution size compared to the original graph. What we did, we took the graph, like we took the Voronoi diagram of the solution overlaid with the Voronoi diagram of the, mm, of the optim optimum solution and the approximate solution, we took the overlay of this graph, said that this is depth r applied to minor, so this is also for an expansion, and we took the r division there. And this is like the important fact. It happens like in a lot of things in planar graphs, etc. that you take some partition to clusters and you do the r division of the cluster graph, or, or, but not the original graph. Like, but so that you want the graph size to be comparable with the solution. Yeah? The graph size was like approximate solution plus the optimum solution. So, so now epsilon times this one is very meaningful. This is epsilon times what we constructed times what we wanted to construct. Yeah, so this is like something tiny. If you think of this guys as being comparable, this is like epsilon times, this is the error you can afford, yeah, up there. And now we, the point of the, that why we did this cluster is that to say that if you get the cell, the cell, the guys in the interior of the one solution are co covered by the guys from the other solution. That was the important property, yeah, that, the, if you look at the guy inside the, inside the cell, not on the boundary, on the cell, then it has got only edges in this cluster graph, in this contracted graph H, with the, others, uh, with the overlapping cells from the other solution, for the uplink clusters from the other solution, so all these guys dominate what these guys dominate. And the union of these clusters contains the union of these clusters. So we can swap these guys for these guys. So there's no cluster, where the interior guys from approximate solution, there are more of them than the all guys from the approximate, from the optimum solution. Yeah? So on every class, the, on every, the error, the, our approximate solution makes compared to the optimum solution is the boundary of the cluster, roughly. Yeah? And the total size of the boundary is epsilon of this one, so we are done. Yeah, and this is like a common theme. And the idea of the, mm, yep. So that's what we are doing here, and uh, now on the tutorials, we try to apply this for a packing problem, not a covariance problem. This was a covariance problem, and on this tutorials, we will try to apply to our independent set, which is a packing problem, and see uh, how we will do, uh, how it will match, and what changes here. And I think I had slightly, I finished 20 minutes before. That's the last lecture, so I stop here. Uh, thanks a lot, and this is an excellent moment to pick up your mobile phone and fill in the survey on Imufos, unless you are not registered for the, then you can do it. Thanks a lot.